Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's truly an honor to be at this great conference. Um, and I think that last question that came up about pleiotropy uh, and looking at really the full spectrum of variant effects is what I want to talk about today uh, in my talk. So like many others in the room, uh, we use multiplex assays of variant effects, sometimes called MAVES, to score many variants all in high throughput. What I think is different about the way we do this in, in my lab at the Crick is that we always try to put variants into the human genome context. And five years ago, this was, this was new, but now it's becoming more and more the way we do these experiments. And I, I'd start to actually argue that it's almost easier to edit the genome now than it is to, to clone a variant on a plasmid. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're getting there. So in uh, 2014, we developed a method called saturation genome editing, uh, which is a tool to put all variants in the genome uh, in a single genomic region up to about 150 bases. Uh, and we first demonstrated the clinical utility of this on BRSA1 in 2018, and Phoebe's going to talk more about uh, our work on that more recently uh, coming up later this afternoon. But when we started the group at the Crick, what we were really out to do is to actually ask how can we improve the assay? And these are some of the things we wanted to get at. So one is can we make it more quantitative? Uh, and, by, and, and are there ways we can get more mechanistic information out of the assay? It's one of these holistic approaches, look at gene function. Um, <clears throat> And then last, uh, can we, if we can get more quantitative information and more mechanistic information, can we better resolve complex genotype phenotype maps? So uh, this is a slide that looks a lot like the one Fritz showed in his talk, but I think that the, the very simplistic way of looking at this is we want to use an assay to say whether a variant is pathogenic or benign. But if we think about all the complexity under, underlying that equation, there's, there's mechanistic complexity on the genetic level, uh, different mechanisms by which variants impact function. There's dosage effects of variants, the, the degree to which function is impacted, and there's also cell type specificity across all the different cells and tissues in the body. Uh, and then as the, the pleiotropy question gets at, there's different phenotypes, and then maybe a different disease risk for each phenotype for, for a given variant. So I think this is where we have to move to make these assays more useful uh, in, in the long term. So, and then I'd argue that VHL is really a model tumor suppressor for going in this direction because we have really good clinical data to be able to calibrate how well we're doing. So that's what I'll talk about today, and this is all work done by Megan Buckley and my group at the Crick, and we just very recently posted a preprint on this, so you can uh, scan the QR code and, and look up the data uh, if you're interested. So some background on VHL. Uh, we know that VHL is a tumor suppressor that plays a key role in regulating the cellular response to hypoxia. It's an E3 ligase that degrades HIF. Uh, somatic mutations in VHL are very common in renal cell carcinoma, particularly clear cell. And germline variants cause a predisposition syndrome known as VHL disease. And why I think VHL is a great model for, for studying variant effects across a complex landscape is that there are different types of VHL disease. So type 1 disease on the far right here is marked by a high uh, kidney cancer risk and a very low pheochromocytoma risk, whereas the different flavors of type 2 disease are all marked by a very high pheo risk. And then there, there are different additional tumors that patients get. Uh, in type 2B, there's, there's a high risk of clear cell RCC as well. Type 2A, hemangioblastoma, but no CCRCC. And then type 2C, pheochromocytoma. So the molecular basis of disease is complex. Uh, even though we, we know the basic mechanisms by which VHL functions in cells, uh, ClinVar reflects this complexity with the fact there are over 800 variants of uncertain significance in a relatively short gene. Uh, and I'd argue that the full genotype phenotype spectrum across tissues is still unresolved for far more variants, too. So we took our SGE protocol and really optimized it to be able to give us more quantitative effects. Uh, some of the key changes I've tried to summarize here, so we improved the transfection, uh, the uniformity of our libraries, especially in regions of high GC content, and then also the haploid cell purity. Uh, we had to make the selection a little bit longer uh, from when the time editing is completed on day six. We go a full two weeks before we perform sequencing to ask how each variant affects function. Uh, and then because VHL is a relatively short gene, in uh, only seven SGE libraries, we can tile across the complete coding sequence of the gene. In total, this uh, approach uh, enabled us to generate function scores for over 2,000 variants. So the one key technical point I want to highlight here is that um, we rely on haploid cells being haploid to get a reliable measurement of function. And what we found is that for us, adding this uh, drug called DAB to our culture media had this effect of, of purifying the cells. We can actually see them get smaller uh, under the microscope. 
so, so we, we purify the haploid population, which prevents this known phenomenon of the cells reverting to diploidy. And when we do this, we compare the uh, SGE results just for run region exon 2 here. The, the effect size goes from being quite small for VHL to, to much, much larger. And then this also helps us see more graded effects across all the regions that we assayed. So this is what we're doing now going forward for SGE. And we do have comparisons between DAB and no, no DAB in cells, and we don't see any major effects or distortions caused by adding the drug. So this allows us to get statistically significant variant scores across a broad range, which is what I'm trying to show you here. So we can apply a FDR cutoff to ask uh, what variants are actually statistically significantly different from synonymous. And when we do that, uh, we see there's quite a wide range of effects here. Now, this is what the same data look like, but now color-coded by the consequence of the mutation with missense variants in green, uh, nonsense in pink. And what we see if we look at the overall map here is that uh, because we're doing SGE, we get effects both in coding sequence space, so missense and nonsense drop out in some regions, and then also non-coding space as well. So we can see variants at splice junctions here, for instance, uh, that score lowly. So we didn't see any loss of function variants prior to methionine 54, and that's because that's a known alternate translation initiation site. Um, but all the variants before that in ClinVar are VUS, which is important to note. And then we also tested a region of intron 1 in which there had been reports of cryptic splicing variation. We didn't see any variants dropping out in intron 1 in our assay, uh, nor in the 3' UTR either. Uh, but as you can see, many of these missense variants that score lowly or intermediately map to these uh, beta sheets or alpha helices of the secondary structure of the protein. So we thought, because this is a holistic assay, we're not measuring a specific function of VHL. We thought maybe we can get at this somehow by modifying the assay and trying again. Um, so why does VHL loss actually cause the cells to grow more slowly? Well, it's not a phenomenon that's unique to HAF1 cells. In fact, it's virtually almost all cells assayed in DEPMAP here with CRISPR screening. Uh, there's a VHL growth defect. It's really only the, the cells of renal origin in which there's already a VHL mutation where we don't see dropout. So what we did is we thought this would, might be a HIF-dependent effect. And sure enough, when we knock out HIF1A and then repeat the experiments for two SGE regions, we see by and large every effect that goes away in the assay. And in fact, if you look at the correlation of what the data looked like before versus what it looks like now when we've done the HIF-1 knockout, there's no correlation whatsoever. So I think this is a way to say very confidently the effects for measuring are HIF dependent. And it's, but in doing so, we can add more kind of mechanistic information on top of the SGE assay. Okay, so thinking more about mechanism, the other thing we do often in SGE is look at the uh, effects of variants on the RNA level, so mRNA expression, and we calculate what we call an RNA score by quantifying reads uh, for each variant in RNA normalized to genomic DNA. So here are our RNA scores for exon 2. This is uh, just on the day 6 time point in the assay, and then this is what the RNA scores look like on day 20. So as you can see, the maps are quite similar across two different time points. What is not similar is how the RNA scores look compared to the function scores. So, so many variants drop out, they have low function scores, even though the RNA is actually not impacted. If we look at this trend more globally, what we see is that uh, here's that population of variants with normal RNA scores uh, here, <laughs> uh, including most nonsense variants because there's actually a very weak effect of NMD across VHL. It's a short gene, only three exons, so that's predicted. And then we can also calibrate this dosage effect. If you look at all the synonymous variants, which are blue or dark blue here, we see that the cells actually tolerate some degree of mRNA reduction until we get to a score, an RNA score about minus three, which corresponds to about a 90% loss at the transcript level. And that's when these variants start to have uh, an effect on a growth in the assay. So this is a nice way to try to calibrate this. Um, but as you can see, there's still some substantial noise here. It's, it's hard to set that dosage threshold precisely. Uh, but what we can say is that most of these variants that score lowly on function and have relatively normal RNA scores are acting at the protein level. And sure enough, if we take all of our uh, function scores and take the average for each amino acid, we can, we can do this where we map it to the protein structure. Uh, and you get results like this. So, so we see a, a pocket where VHL binds HIF and targets it for degradation, and that lights up. And then we also see certain residues that are important for the interaction between VHL and elongin C uh, 
uh, scoring lowly as well with, with the, the mapping to the, the protein level. Okay, so for the question of actually calibrating this to clinical data, let's start by just doing the analysis that we always look at first, which is how well does this work on ClinVar annotations. Uh, if we just take all annotations independent of what the variant has been called pathogenic for, uh, we see it's working pretty well. And we can just do, do a ROC analysis and determine optimal uh, cutoff point. It's around minus 0.4 in the assay, so that's, that's actually quite subtle, reflecting the relatively low noise. Uh, and when we do that, we get uh, 95% sensitivity for detecting pathogenic variants at 98% specificity. So this is, again, taking all annotations. I'd, I'd argue this is working pretty well. If, in contrast, we don't take variants that are annotated as causing disease but are just seen in population sequencing, we see quite a different story. Um, in this case, uh, we summed up allele counts from Nomad, uh, UK Biobank, and TopMed. Uh, and as you can see, all the variants, even if they're at relatively low counts, so between 5, 10, up to 100, there are many of these variants here that are actually still called variants of muscular significance or have conflicting interpretations. None of these are actually dropping out in the assay. Uh, and this, I think, reflects the fact that VHL disease is quite rare. Okay, so because VHL is also very commonly mutated in cancers somatically, we can ask, are the same variants that drive cancer formation uh, causing VHL disease? And to do this analysis, we uh, took all the reported VHL variants from the CBOB portal database. Uh, and then what we're doing here in this plot is color coding them uh, by what cancer type they, they showed up in. So there's a lot of red on the far left of this plot because almost every variant that we scored as loss of function has actually already been seen, many of them only once, but, but, but actually already seen uh, in an RCC sample. And if we blow this up further, so here's looking more closely at the distribution, uh, what we see is that there's uh, these, these other types of RCC as well, so chromophobe and papillary. The rate of VHL mutation in these cancers is much lower than in clear cell. But when we do see a VHL variant there, they're scoring just as lowly. So this actually hints that these tumors might be misclassified based on the histology alone. And, and really, um, knowing the molecular information about the mutations might improve classification here, and therefore uh, dictate treatment. Um, and then if we look at all the VHL variants uh, in other cancers, so the blue, these are cancers that haven't yet been linked to a germline mutation in VHL. And really what we see there is we're just drawn from a random distribution that reflects the broader distribution of scores in the assay. So there's no enrichment here for loss of function whatsoever, consistent with the fact these are passenger mutations, not drivers. Okay, then to really get at this idea, are we seeing driver effects? Uh, we can also use the CBOB portal data uh, to ask how many times have we seen a given variant in cancer? And, uh, and ones that show up repeatedly tend to score lowly. Uh, and at what allele frequency is a variant in, in a tumor uh, based on its function score as well. And it's, it's noisy because there's a lot of noise in, in sequencing tumors and calling allele frequencies, um, but this is a, a significant correlation here of lower function scores correlating uh, with higher allele frequencies, really suggesting these are drivers, in fact. Okay, so we wanted to take all this data uh, from different sets, uh, ClinVar, cancer, uh, and ask, can we get at this, this question of some of these variants in red here, for instance, that look like they're neutral, are these actually variants we're missing with the assay, or, um, or are these spontaneous variants that have arisen in these cancers just by chance? So what we did is we defined these gold standard sets, and I'd argue that this is a quite liberal definition of what gold standard is. We're just requiring any variant to be seen uh, two or more times, so two independent cancer cases, or in one CCRCC sample, and then also in ClinVar is pathogenic and benign, or sorry, pathogenic. Um, and then for the uh, benign set, we just took anything that's benign or likely benign in ClinVar, and then also added in variants that are, uh, or, or, or sorry, required these to also be seen in at least one population control. And when we do this, we're able to draw a clean line that separates the CCRCC associated variants with the neutral variants. And I think, as many of you know, this analysis can be uh, confounded by the fact we're mostly looking at nonsense and synonymous. So we have to change the criteria a little bit to do this for missense variants, because I think there's only two missense variants that are likely benign in VHL. But when we apply uh, the same criteria for what is CCRCC associated, uh, with this criteria, we're just taking all missense variants that aren't pathogenic in ClinVar, and they've been seen at least two times in uh, the combination of these three databases. And when we do that, we still have perfect separation just on missense variants alone. Uh, 
So this really suggests that this assay does, in fact, work for missense. OK, so uh, I want to just have a single slide on computational predictors. Uh, I think there's an interesting trend here. We see in that uh, we've taken many of the state-of-the-art predictors and compared them to our function scores. Uh, and in each case, what we see is uh, predictors tend to have many variants in, in the top right quadrant um, where we're calling the variant neutral with SGE, but the computational predictor thinks it's del deleterious. Uh, and this was very consistent across predictors. OK, so if we take very naive thresholds here um, that separate out variants that are either CCRCC associated uh, or those that are neutral, we can apply those to all the variants that haven't yet been classified and ask how much reclassification can we actually do. I know this isn't a formal analysis for the, for the validated assay yet, but we think we're on the road there. And we want to get an estimate of how many variants might we be able to affect the classification of. Um, and in total, of the 430 BUS that we tested that were SNVs, uh, only 7% of them scored as loss of function. So these are the ones down here. And some of these have already been seen in CCRCC uh, somatically. Um, and then of those that are absent from ClinVar, only about 10% uh, scored as loss of function by this criteria. And that's a lot lower fraction than the fraction of BUS uh, that have been seen in a CBAR portal sample, but haven't been uh, definitively associated with cancer in that sample. OK, so I want to come back to this question I, I started with about how different variants uh, lead to different types of VHL disease. What's driving this process? And can we model this with a single assay alone, or do we need lots of different assays to get at this? So we scraped uh, annotations from the VHL database, um, which is a combination of uh, clinical data, literature reports, uh, somatic mutations. It's, it's not the most uh, well curated, I'd say. Um, but we simply said whether or not a SNB was associated with only type 1 phenotype or only type 2 phenotype, which is pheo predominant. Uh, and what we see is there's this difference in scores uh, with the pheo predominant variants uh, scoring greater than minus 1 on average, and the pathogenic variants uh, for type 1 uh, scoring around minus 2.5 on average. So this is actually a pretty sizable difference here that we, we think reflects a gradient of, of HIF activity. And just showing what all the other uh, pathogenic variants look like for which the data, the clinical data was uh, ambiguous, there's almost two populations, I'd argue. Um, ones that score higher, maybe more consistent with a type 2 phenotype, uh, and then ones that score more lowly uh, down here, more consistent with a type 1 phenotype. And this is just what all the other uh, variants look like that haven't yet been called pathogenic in ClinVar. So we think that this one dimension we're measuring with the assay is actually reporting back uh, on, on where these variants fall on the, the HIF regulation scale from this. And this is summed up in this model. We think that in uh, type 1 disease, uh, we have more complete loss of function. That leads to a greater accumulation of HIF. And then the different uh, types of VHL disease uh, reflect that different amounts of, of, HIF, of HIF building up. And this is important because VHL has been studied for so long. People have looked for other interactions that explain uh, pheochromocytoma phenotype in particular, so the type 2C variants. Um, but this also agrees with the recent review in the literature that suggests maybe all the effects are actually HIF-mediated, just in a dosage-mediated way. Um, I think we definitely can't say for sure that we're not, uh, there, there aren't other HIF-independent effects at this point. Um, but our data is certainly consistent with the model where, where the gradient is really important. OK, um, so how can we actually use this data uh, for guiding uh, treatments for patients with VHL disease? So I'd argue that from the uh, strength of separation of, of variants uh, we're seeing between neutral and CCRCC, we can certainly reduce the variance of uncertain significance uh, that have been seen in both germline testing and for tumor profiling, uh, which may be important for predicting therapy response. Um, and then I think we can also start to think about using this data to give patients a more uh, uh, precise calibration of where their VHL disease may, may go over time. So now that I've shown you all the data, I want to bring it together and look at two very specific mechanisms we saw in the map. Uh, the first is this effect we saw at the end of the gene. So not all stop codons lead to loss of function. Uh, I think often we approximate this by where in the gene NMD occurs, but really that's, that's probably not the best proxy, especially in genes where uh, there's no strong NMD. But what we see is that once we get past helix 4 uh, in the last exon of VHL, uh, nonsense mutations in red here no longer have deleterious effects. <clears throat> and so 
we wondered about this because if you look in CBAR portal, what you see is there's actually indels all the way until the very end of the gene. But when you sort those indels by whether or not they're in the plus one reading frame or the minus one reading frame, once you get past this position where truncating mutations no longer matter, every single one of them that's been seen is in the plus one reading frame. So what we think is going on here is that this particular reading frame leads to a very long 42 amino acid extension that we've just modeled here on the protein. And we think it's that long C-terminal extension that actually is, is destabilizing the protein and leading to loss of function. So there's this reading frame specific effect that is really nicely highlighted by showing exactly where nonsense mutations no longer matter. <clears throat> and in fact, we validated this just by looking at indels in this region. And sure enough, when we create random indels just by cutting with CRISPR, we can confirm this is a reading frame specific effect. OK, then I want to briefly touch on the one nonsense mutation we had in the middle of the gene that didn't drop out. And it used, it used to be the case that when we had a variant like this, it was typically the assay was just too noisy. Uh, now we have a pretty clean assay, I'd, I'd argue, and yet we're still seeing this variant uh, W88 stop code on here um, that scores almost, as, almost at zero, so, so neutral. What's interesting is this has been reported before in a patient, but it's, it's the only stop code on that's been reported to cause type 2 disease. And I went back and read the paper. Sure enough, the patient had uh, early onset pheochromocytoma, and I think their brother had it too. So this is a, a very strong kind of report of a type 2 phenotype. So we think this actually mirrors the clinical data, um, which is interesting. <laughs> um, and we're not quite sure why. So there are a couple other stop codons uh, that also don't score as lowly as most. In, in each case, it's an opal codon. Um, so we think this might be something to do with nonsense, uh, sorry, stop codon read through. Uh, maybe RNA editing, uh, but this is something we're looking into further now. And I think it really highlights how having data sets like this that are clean and unbiased can highlight new mechanisms to, to, to probe more going forward. Okay, so I'll wrap up. Um, I told you about our assay is uh, working well to identify loss of function variants in VHL uh, and that we can actually identify uh, CCRCC related variants with up to 100% accuracy depending on how we curate our gold standard variants. Um, and I think because of this, this, this data set's really going to make an impact for how we treat uh, VHL disease and VHL mutant tumors as well. Um, I think I want to end by highlighting, you know, we drew two thresholds here to call CCRCC associated and neutral. I think those thresholds should probably be different depending on exactly what type of VHL disease we want to say a variant is, is uh, pathogenic for. And I think there's also a lot of variants right in this region here around minus 0.4 to minus 0.5, um, where I think we have to look a lot more carefully at what's going on there. A lot of these are those ones that are predicted to be deleterious by computational uh, effect models. And, and there's this question of, of whether or not um, how we want to go about calibrating that, that middle zone here. So I think we've made a lot of progress in looking at intermediate effect variants uh, with, with a model like VHL, but there's still challenges uh, to go. So with that, I just want to thank uh, everyone in the lab who's contributed a lot to this project, uh, particularly Megan, who's uh, just been an enormous uh, force for, for getting these experiments done and also setting up the lab. Uh, and then also Scott and Samra's uh, uh, collaborative efforts uh, as well. And um, of course, happy to share data and protocols at this point. So please reach out if interested. Thank you very much. <clears throat>Wild data with F1 alpha being the sole substrate. Do you th I mean, just given that it's kind of part of that ubiquitous in ligase Carl complex with the HL, how confident are you that, that if you didn't do a knockout for some of the other substrates, you wouldn't have kind of greater penetrance? So I think what we've seen is that knocking out HIF1 is definitely sufficient to reverse the effects for all 800 variants. Um, we haven't tested whether there are other genes we can also knock out. We did, we did a little panel, um, and we didn't, so we looked at EPAS1 or HIF2. Um, we didn't see an effect there, which I think is actually consistent with some of the described roles of HIF1 and HIF2 in, in signaling, and um, 
how they change over the, the course of tumor evolution. Um, but but we, haven't, we haven't looked fully at it yet. Okay. I'm going to keep us on schedule. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thanks. Thank you.